I'm just really here to observe and listen because uh, I've never been in this space before. Oh, but, oh, um, but we don't let you do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but welcome. Thank, welcome. Thank you. Thank what, you. What level, I, and I just turned the recording on. I forgot to. Oh, oh okay. no, no. Anyway, Good. So, Joy, what level do you teach? Uh, well, I'm at a small uh, a small school in Westchester, New York. So uh, we have a very small English language learner population. So unlike mm -hmm. a lot of districts where there'll be a, an ENL or English as a new language teacher for like one or two grades, I'm for the whole school. So I work with all the, you know, all grades from K all the way through eight. Wherever there are English language learners, mm -hmm. I'll be there working with them. So. <laughs> got it, got it. Jill. Thank you. Back from Thailand. <laughs> Just go ahead and introduce yourself if you don't mind and your thoughts Hi. as we get started. Hi, I'm uh, Jill Stanronsky. I work at William Annan uh, Middle School, eighth grade language arts, creative writing, TED Talk electives, literacy support, um, adjunct at uh, Drew University. And I, I think for me, it's very just natural. The entire writing thing and the feedback is everybody has a thought regardless of their culture their religion their language and so i want students just to recognize that writing is just putting your thoughts down on paper whatever language however they come out and we should always be valuing people's uh, authentic voices cool, cool. Kirsten. We're going around I'm, and doing quick introduction. I'm a retired high school English teacher. And um, I'm now adjuncting freshman composition at um, Old Dominion University and Norfolk State University, which is in Hampton Roads, Virginia. And um, I worked with Dr. Franz at um, the College of William and Mary um, a while back for the CERN program. So I'm excited to see her here this cool. evening. What's this topic mean to you? Is that, Kirsten, I was asking you that. Uh, internet problem, yeah, it's cool, cool. We'll come back. Uh, David. Sure. Welcome. Uh, nice to be here. Um, I'm excited to, hear, excited to hear about this session. Um, I'm in Berkeley, California. I work with a small nonprofit named called NextMap. Um, what does the topic mean to me? Um, I'm just going to free associate to something I'm trying to prepare. I'm supposed, I, I'm not supposed to be, and we'll be in Alaska a week from today, working with a bunch of native communities. Um, mm. And there's a great deal of attention paid to what's called traditional ecological knowledge and the literacies that they use to express that and how to be mindful about that in the design of the activities that we're doing. So, um, that's a setting in which um, this topic seems really relevant. So I'm excited to hear more. Cool, cool. Paul, who's six weeks into his semester already. <laughs> six, <laughs> six, six weeks in. You want to hear something funny? We're going to go on fall break for two weeks. <laughs> so about three and a half weeks from now, we, we get a nice uh, little fall break, time to put on yeah. the Ugg boots, a little bit of you know, Yeah. So New York, New York City schools start. Yeah. Oh, you're starting tomorrow. Okay. Like yes. after Labor Day. Yeah. Yeah. So um, tonight's uh, subject for me, you know, I feel like the pro the proscriptive approach uh, devalues voice almost too easily, almost to the point of like, we, we, we should expect it to, and then it does, and we shouldn't be surprised that it does. But my own daughter just started teaching kindergarten um, in Evansville at a K through eight school. And if we include English, she has four languages happening in that room right now, one of which is Marshallese. Uh, you know, those students need to find a way into the big ideas, like through their voice I mean, from the from the very beginning. And Maddie was concerned that she doesn't teach Spanish. She doesn't or she doesn't speak Spanish or uh, or, or Haitian Creole or Marshallese. And the easy thing to say is, well, Maddie, that's not your job. Your job is to teach them English. And that's already, I think, the first step toward that devaluation of uh, authentic voice that's coming up from those children. So I really want to hear what the uh, 
what the author says tonight. I'm uh, I'm I'm here for it. I, so I'm, I have the Google Doc open so I can take some notes in the back channel. Oh, cool. And you'll share those with us. So I, I want to say that I'm quite excited about this. Um, Bonnie Bentham and I started talking about it with Chris, who's going to introduce herself here in, here in a second to go. Whenever Christina noticed that we were developing writing partners that were correcting um, grammar and spelling and so forth, and Christina said, oh, you, you got to look at this because, uh, you know, standard English is going to smash all those kids' voices. And and then Bonnie had lots of stories, and hopefully she'll be here, about how she, she's it, she's been on a journey around all that, too. Um, and this week, I, we actually did program some... A, just one actually and really worked on it. Um, a writing partner that we hope honors African American um, language. Um, we, we may or may not have a chance to look at that tonight, but I'll show you where you can look at it. Um, so that that's sort of the goal. Like, can we use AI to make AI not smash our kids' voices? <laughs> Which so that's that's what we're playing with. Jack and Christina, introductions, please. Uh, hey, I'm Jack Marmerstein. I come with come with Christina. Um, the topic the topic seems I, I've spent my career in, in in language learning and second language acquisition. So 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 literally, I've been switching between voices and between languages and and all the social and and emotional and political and 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 uh, you know educational consequences of that. So, so really curious, somewhat optimistic, mildly optimistic, but ca cautiously optimistic about the potential of AI. Uh, but also, also, uh, you know, with a with a degree of caution uh, in there. So, um, and I'm Christina Cantrell. I work for the National Writing Project, um, and I'm a Philadelphian and the Philadelphia Writing Project person. So all the languages who speak in Philadelphia, you know, <laughs> like need to be represented, um, and the and not just represented but honored. That's like that's what feels important. And you know, I float between sort of like like excitement and trepidation about AI in the same way I float about float uh, in that same space around um, schooling in general. <laughs> uh, so you know, I we've moved towards standardization in in u.s education and the consequences have been um pretty staggering so how how can we use a the opportunity of ai uh maybe this moment at least to reflect on what really makes us human and get back to something that's that's not standardized but individualized so. i'm loving these introductions thank you time for them. Um, and it's Debbie, do you want to go ahead? Um, you know, I almost don't know what to say. Um, part of me wants to say that what I loved about the book is that it echoes so many of the things that librarians, I work with librarians, that librarians are trying to do in terms of authentic research and um, action research. It also echoes with the IB people who are doing transliteracy and, and, the, and the whole movement around having, you know, 15 languages in the same classroom. There is, it's, it's part of what the, 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 the uh, water that they swim in. Um, what I what I wanted to say is that it, it, your book impacted me just yesterday because I were, I'm working with a librarian to try to have um, to to distill her knowledge around a thesis statement into an AI coach for coaching a thesis statement and. We did all this work around what it should look like and everything. And the one line at the end she said was, but wait a minute, you know, all this is generic advice. We really, how do we, how do we get at the, um, 
at, at the student's background and why the student is writing or doing this research and what the thesis means in that context. And I said, let me tell you, that is the, this whole book I just finished, because that's the question that the AI has to get to before it does anything else, before it starts giving advice about anything, just like a human being. You want to find out what is the context of the person you're you're facing, and what is the purpose of what you're doing. So I just I love the book, and thank you for writing it. <laughs> Sam, uh, hey folks, uh, it's good to see um, some some familiar faces and see, see some new faces. My name is Reed, aka Sam Reed the Third, aka Teacherpreneur. I, I teach at the U School in Philadelphia. I like to say I teach young folks to rewrite and make sense of the world. And I'm on a sabbatical this year, y'all. So like I'm getting used to something a little bit different. So I, I got I can meet with Paul during the middle of the week. <laughs> Which is really cool. So uh yeah. Oh, but um the the my stance is like we have to meet students where they are how they speak, where they speak, what they speak, the purposes of their, their speaking, writing, creating, all of that. We just have to meet them where they are. And when we do that, magic stuff happens. So I, I, I want to be a part of that magic. Thank you. Marina. Hi, um, I'm Marina. I'm a third grade teacher in um, Westchester. And I'm really happy that one of my colleagues is here, Joy. I believe she already introduced herself. She started. And I'm really office. excited. Oh, you did? Oh, good for you, Joy. I invited her this evening. Joy and I um, are very, very um, close friends, close colleagues. Um, we love when we get to work together. So I'm sure you all know that um, Joy is the ENL, English as a New Language teacher, at our very, very small district. And what I love, one thing, one of the things I love about working with her is that we have so many language rich conversations about language. Um, mm -hmm. And I just love that. And we also have this very similar philosophy of, um, you know, supporting our students and building a classroom and designing a space that um, is grounded in assets and, you um, and I believe that language is an asset. And I'm really excited to hear, especially as an elementary educator, um, just the conversation that emerges this after uh, this evening. Yeah, one of the questions I, had, I thought of you, the questions I had was, do children have a language and language patterns? I think they probably do. That's different than adults. But anyway, I, we're, I believe that. L Lynette, um, you probably came just to, to listen, but we're not going to let you do that. You want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Paul, I came just to listen. <laughs> Lynette's here. Yay. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi. No, I just got off. But another, introduce uh, you. I, uh, I'm Lynette Mormon, um, a former uh, New York City Writing Project person. I was a director at New York City Writing Project and uh, worked with the National. So I know a lot of <laughs> the National as well as New York City Writing Project people. And Paul has been a friend and colleague for many, many years. And I have tuned in because I am retired. <laughs> so, but it's, um, I really was interested. Cecilia actually sent me a connection, I think, today. And I said, I really want to hear this conversation about this book. All right, that took uh, some time, but I think it's worth it. It's really lovely to have all of you here and all the different perspectives. But Hannah, um, um, Marina, you went right on top of Hannah, by the way. Uh, you want to just move over a little bit or Hannah move over a little bit? Mm. I, I don't know if it matters too much, but using the, oh, yeah, there okay. you go. Move around. Okay. Hannah, introduce yourself Perfect. and talk to us about your book. and. Hannah and I talked about um, presenting one thing, and then I sent her an email this morning. Uh, saying, you have much more presentation ready than we will have time for, but um, sure. go for it. And and oh, okay. And what I what I really want to say is that, and I told Hannah that this is how we roll. 
Um, I, I want to invite you to interrupt, if that's okay, Hannah, and you know, keep your mics open um, if you'd like to, and just have a conversation. And we'll we'll do it kind of officially at, at different points. But okay, everyone cool with that? Great, great. Hannah, over okay. to you. Okay, perfect. Okay, can you all see my presentation? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, I've never used Como Space before. Okay, so yes. Um, like Paul said, like, feel free to interrupt. I just like caveat, I can't see everyone. Well, I don't know how to do that while I'm sharing my screen. So just jump in as you can. Um, but I'm really excited to be here. And it was nice to, to hear from all of you. Um, so my book um, just came out in June, A Linguistically Inclusive Approach to Grading Writing, A Practical Guide from Teachers College Press. Um, and after um, my conversation with Paul, we decided um, Today, I'm going to be talking about feedback, especially, which is um, really the bulk, the bulk of the book. So we say, uh, lots of us say grading to grade papers when we mean much, much more than grading. And a lot of that is feedback. Um, so a little bit about my background so you can kind of understand how I'm coming to this topic. Um, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I went to public schools there. That was very formative for me. It's where I... Um, it's, it's a it's a it was a, a primary um, place where I gained appreciation of language patterns, language variation, and African American English in particular, um, which led me to um, my focus in linguistics. I also, in my experience in Richmond Public Schools, is where I sort of like saw firsthand racism in action in, in our school system. And so that's also like it, always a big motivator for me. Uh, so I have BA and MA in linguistics, but a lot of the work that I was doing in linguistics involved um, working with with um, K-12 students or teachers. Um, and so I, I shifted into education and literacy um, and I have um, um, a master's and a PhD in education related fields. Um, so so the slide, there we go. Um, so I, I, I started kind of more K-12 and have moved, moved to higher ed. Um, did I you change meeting. slides? Sorry, yeah, guys. can you see that? Uh, we did I not did. see it. Yeah. Oh no, why not? What if you click the left this? side, just on the... You can just click on the little pet chiclet change yeah. it. Now yeah. we see. Can you see now? Yeah, that's advising. Okay, you see, did y'all see this at all? This no. One? We see teaching no. advising now. Okay, now okay, we're so in my when, oh, Okay. You're clicking now, though. You're good. Sorry. All right. I, yeah, we, well, it's kind of small here, but I'll just do it this way then instead of in present. It looks like when I was presenting, you can see. Okay, that's what I just went over. Uh, there's the visual for that. Okay, you can see... Okay. A book cover, undergraduate yeah. research. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's presenting. Was okay, cool. okay. Yeah. Um, appreciate that. Um, so I taught um, sixth grade reading, um, in Norfolk, Virginia, um, as a Kirsten Hussier. Um, well, taught in Norfolk, but not not uh, sixth grade reading. Um, and when I went back to school, I worked with an undergraduate research program, a women Mary, for students from backgrounds that were underrepresented as the college, um, which led to my first um, book, which was co-authored um, with Anne Charity Hudley, um, who I've worked with continually. I also worked with her in my in my undergrad time. I've taught um, first year writing and research writing in community college and four year college. And currently I um, work with the um, at the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. Um, advising our undergraduate and graduate scholars. Um, it's a merit and need-based um, scholarship. And so a lot of the student writing that I work with now primarily is um, essays for applications for fellowships and for, for graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, so all that work with students and kind of like coming from my linguistic um, lens, I learned a lot about the different types of writing feedback students were getting um, and led me to um, my dissertation where I looked at, there I focused on community college, but I looked at, uh, analyzed set, uh, a large set of graded papers specifically for what the instructors were responding to in terms of language patterns and how they were responding to them. 
And so um, that's that's the large research base that um, um, the book um, stems from. Um, but kind of like the intermediate phase there was a project um, that we called Students Write to Their Own Writing. I work with Anne again. So Anne um, Charity Hudley, she's the Associate Dean at the Stanford um, Graduate School of Education now. Um, and so we got a grant from the um, Conference on uh, College Composition and Communication to create guides for black students and their instructors on student agency in college writing. Um, and so that's, um, it's the, the uh, website where the guides are is SRTOW, so the acronym for students write to their own writing.org. Um, and that was really a team effort. So Anne and I worked with um, another faculty member, um, Michelle Pitty Gruy, who um, teaches composition at UC Santa Barbara. And then here are some of our um, students who are on the team. Um, Angela Rao, um, who's on the left, um, was instrumental in a lot of the web design and um, was at the time a master's student at San Francisco State in speech language pathology. Marie Tano is a PhD student um, in linguistics at Stanford. And then Sierra Johnson was an undergrad um, in linguistics at William & Mary. So um, it really was a team effort. And a lot of the work that we did to create the guides involved um, leading focus groups with um, Black college students and, and recent college graduates um, and with faculty and researchers who specialize in, in writing in African American English and, and Kirsten who's here um, helped us with that with with those focus groups as well um, and gave us Hannah, some really um, good I do have a, yeah I have a quick question and yeah. I want to say that it, it's wonderful to see the voices from those focus groups sprinkled that's quite yeah. wonderful um, what is the relationship between the students rights to their own writing of uh, students right to their own writing? And the 1974 document from Four C's, and like that was like a, is is this now the the revised version of that, or do you want it to be? And then what's the relationship to your book? Is that sure? Yeah, no, I don't want it to be a revised version, but it definitely um, mm -hmm. stems from there. So I think a lot has been done over the past. Hum how many years is that? 50 years? It is 50. 50. We yeah. know that because the writing project is 50 sure, years. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Um, sure. To take um, students right to their own language and, and make it um, applicable in practical ways in different contexts. And so we wanted to do that for writing and feedback on writing in college context for Black students specifically. Um, so we see it as a very practical application. Our, our focus throughout the website is on tangible takeaways. So as many examples we can give for instructors as far as like comments go, things like that. And then examples for students, like questions that they can ask um, their professor in office hours, um, just as many takeaways as possible. So that's a relationship and it was, um, the project was funded by the by the four C's, um, which is part mm -hmm. of NCTE, where the where the um, resolution students write to their own language um, yeah. was generated. Or does that answer your question? I feel like there was another it part. Does. Okay. Um, your book. How how related? And then to yeah. Book? So the book the book is um is based on the my dissertation as is the website, and so the book is really like a deeper dive and covers um, a broader, a, a bit of a broader scope in the website in some sense, but also the website has student guides and my book is really written for instructors. So it doesn't have that that piece directly to students. Now our, um, our first book that was pictured in undergraduate research there, we were writing, writing to students. Um, so those are kind of like the, the different ways that everything's related. Um, so so, sorry. Um, I have a, I have a follow-up. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay to keep going? And Go others for jump it. in here too. So, okay. uh, so I, in the introductions, we heard people mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm teaching second language students or whatever mm -hmm. was uh, 
there are language patterns there. And in your book, you often say, um, you know, African American language, language, I think, is that the correct term? Um, and then you often say other, other language patterns as well, right? So, to, and I think it's really, and that study was really focused on black students, you said, right? So and yeah and and so um, where is the relationship between all of the different stuff in our classroom and focusing in on African American language? That, yeah, yeah. So I think like a couple points there. So um, my background in um, linguistics and in teaching is with Black students in the South. So like African American English and and Southern English varieties. And those patterns are um, where my research focused when I was in, in linguistics. So that's that's where I'm coming from. I've worked like mostly with black students throughout my career. Um, and when I've worked with students who are not black, they're usually again, like from the South. And so that's, that's my experience research wise and teaching wise. Um, and I also think, you know, like I, I don't want to, make my focus on the book or our focus on the website, which is explicitly for black students, diluted by focusing on everyone. But the book has many, many strategies that are useful for responding to any, any type of language pattern, right, regardless of the student. And I also give a lot of examples um, that I found in my research and that also um, I cite other researchers that are common among students from really like different language backgrounds coming in from high school to college or what they've learned about writing in high school or middle school and that kind of transition. So, um, so there's a lot there that's like templates things to do that can be applied. And that's where I think like, I'm really excited. I was like really excited to hear so many people here saying things about English as a new language and working with students who speak um, a variety of languages, because I feel like that's where you all come in and your expertise. Like, I'd love to hear like how you would adapt these to your context, some of, some of the strategies. Can, can I can I hop in when, yeah, when, you, when you talked about like your theoretical frame? I'm wondering like where uh, in your research or fa or your theoretical frame, like where where would Bell Hooks come in and what would her critique of your uh, process like? Where does she yeah? Where does she fit? And I, and I'm saying this because I haven't yeah. read the book yet, so I'm just being transparent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I my book is the the scholars that I cite are firmly in um, in the world of of writing and their research is in writing and working with black college student writing. And so it's it's that's my focus there. I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, I think bell hooks is, is really important and like fundamental for the entire idea of, of just like whose voice are we hearing and who gets recognized i mean i think she she talks about her experience i think in college even um in some of her work and and what that's like and so i i'm really looking at it from the perspective of what happens when a student um gets in the, gets in a writing classroom in college and somebody's writing and or like giving feedback in response to their work um and and how can we do that practically in a way that honors honors students voices i have another sorry i don't want to dominate the question yeah so for others please but i, I do have a follow-up uh, yeah. another follow-up which is so when when I took some of your, many of your principles were, um, about feedback and put them into a prompt in AI, and I took the features of African American language and put them in the prompt, um, and, and, but then asked it, don't just identify those features or something when you get feedback, you know, be a real person, right? 
so here i'll get to my question sorry yeah. my question is if we focus on african american language and responding properly to that is that going to is that going to give us a perspective and a way of proceeding with any student <laughs> and, and or what's missing if we do it that way yeah so i think like i i think that that's a, a really important piece and if if um you all look at the forward um Vershana Shanti Young talks about that specifically and my conversations with him he really wants to reiterate the point that learning about written African American English and rhetoric and patterns is is important and beneficial for all students yeah that's um, nice to say. Yeah. yeah and so um yeah so he he's he's really firmly in that i think stacy perry clark is another um perryman clark is another um person to look at her research um she's at um western michigan i believe and she her her classes are designed um at least when she was first starting out to be afrocentric writing classes and the majority of her students were white um and so she writes a lot about um that dynamic in her class and 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 how it was beneficial for her students let's give other people a chance to jump in if you'd like but then we can come back to your slides if that makes sense sure anybody else want should we go back go good okay. all right go for it <laughs> okay so um I'll pick up here. Um, so this is an overview of um, the practical commenting strategies that are key in a linguistically inclusive approach and how they contrast to like what we might think of as a more traditional approach. So in a linguistically inclusive approach, feedback is about a conversation, right? So it's, it's not just a um, primarily to evaluate and especially not to just to justify a grade. Um, positive comments on student writing are specific rather than general as they might be in a more traditional approach. Um, descriptions of, of students' language patterns and what's going on in their writing is, is specific um, as opposed to just like labels without description, which is I'm thinking of things like disorganized or like unclear, unfocused um, as labels without description um questions are, are essential and so that ties in with feedback as a conversation um and with um the agency of the student writer um and that's contrasted with corrections like direct corrections on student writing in a traditional approach um and prescriptive comments where i'm talking about like the teacher telling the student what to do um, are given with some context in a linguistically inclusive approach instead of without context. So context might be like how and why um, the teacher's giving this suggestion and, and maybe framing it in terms of choice. Um, and then the teacher's subjectivity is also important. Um, so framing the teacher as one reader among potentially multiple audiences or other audiences, whereas a traditional approach um, a lot of suggestions and comments are pre presented as non-negotiable conventions, like this is how writing is, full stop, and um, assumes a standardized English speaking audience, a white audience, sometimes even just like a, a kind of like narrow academic audience. Um, so that's kind of the overview um, of the commenting piece and what those strategies look like. Um, so a lot of this is framed around the feedback as a conversation piece, which um, to me is all about like then students have to be required to do something with the feedback to make it a conversation. So they have to respond, whether it's like in their next draft, they're incorporating feedback or they're like directly responding in comments and like an online word process or Google Docs um, or talking in class and writing conferences but making it an actual conversation. Um, and in our work, our focus groups with students, um, there were comments that pointed to um, 
this being important, but also it being difficult for students coming from often contexts where feedback was not used in that way. So um, one student said, when I go to my professor, I approach it from they're going to tell me what I did wrong and I'll fix it. But the guide turns it more into a conversation about writing, talking about the um, students write to their own writing guide and coming into the middle with it instead of me just fixing what they say. So this is like a, a reframe for the student and how they're used to working with their teacher on their writing. And then another um, student said it was a big transition to college when they cared about the broader scope and what you had to say. It was helpful to hear, can you go more into this? Or this seems extraneous, but it took a while to get used to that. Um, so um, ways that we make that accessible for students um, can um, come through in a big one, like I said before, was asking questions, um, especially questions that are gonna help students be more strategic about their writing. Um, and I have examples in the book, but I, I also cite some here from Tracy Gardner, who um, was a blogger for NCTE um, and wrote these top 10 lists. And this is 10 ways to respond to student drafts. A lot of my examples are um, coming at from college, they're not, not applicable to K-12, but these were, were directly written from, from a K-12 context. So just getting students, asking them, who is your audience? What is, what is your purpose? Um, what stands out? Why did you choose this? How, how would your draft change if you did X, Y, Z? Um, and you can see if I if I get to some more slides or you look in the book, different different ways to use questions. I'm uh, I'd love to hear. I don't know if this is a point anyone wants to jump in, but different ways that you all use questions in your writing feedback, and ways that you promote this feedback as a conversation for students who might not be used to used to working with their writing um, in the classroom in that way. All right, folks, unmute. Come on, jump in. You don't have to. I mean, yes, but... you do. Hi, I, Hannah. Oh, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, Hannah, I, I have not read your book yet, but I've worked with Paul a, a bit uh, over the last two years. And um, I'm also a National Writing Project. But, you know, for me, for the last probably six or seven years, I have not I've gone to an automatic A classroom because I did not want to grade writing anymore. And, you know, that's yeah. been, that, that's a whole other, um, you know, topic, but really what was so great about that was every single writing piece became about a conversation and every writing piece had an audience. We were always just going to write Ted talks or we write for the newspaper or we were writing to our parents or writing to our co-partners in Spain or in Bangladesh. Um, and so I think that's so much a part of it. All of a sudden, when you have, a real audience and the audience wasn't me and there was purpose, then the conversation became very natural, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it had to be a conversation because it wasn't about a grade like, oh, you don't, you don't have enough textual evidence. It was, well, gosh, you know what, guys, we got to really consider when we're talking to Bangladesh and we say this, first of all, they're not going to understand that. And we need to take into, you know, context their religion and their views on things and so let's be careful how we say that what would be the most logical so mm -hmm. i mean i think one of the crucial pieces it's always like is your writing authentic which means it has a true purpose and it has a true audience and then the conversation you know i i i think it becomes very natural mm -hmm. yes yes a real audience is everything it makes everything so much um i mean it's just so much more tangible for the students and so like a, a student who's just used to writing in a vacuum i mean there's the teacher but then there's also like all of the standardized test writing that many of our students have done um over the years and that they don't have a face to that reader no context there and so i think that 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 makes this idea of of what what writing is and what feedback on writing can be very different and so i love that yeah real audience is huge because it's it's really particular right if you were writing persuasive or argumentative pieces and i i hate even those labels but yeah. if you want to shift somebody's mind you have to know your audience to mm -hmm. know 
what's going to be, be the most pertinent. You know, you might be talking to other eighth graders and you might need to first deal with logic. You might be talking to the parents and you might need to gain some evidence that has mm -hmm. some science backing. And my students and I always talk about that. And I almost, I don't even know how to go back to the other piece. I never want them to write just mm -hmm. for the sake of writing. Mm -hmm. Other than in our journals that where we just kind of dump thoughts, dump thoughts, dump thoughts. That I love. But every piece has an audience. That's awesome. Oh, Paul, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I just I dropped a resource into the chat. It's a Google Doc I was working on last weekend as my students are working on uh, the elements of classical oration, which is a new introduction for my seniors. They've never heard these terms, and they think that I'm making them up to hurt their feelings. So <laughs> when we talk about narration and the background element, I was like, well, how do you how do you explain this, right? So I went back to OWL at Purdue and I found like a like a two, uh, and this is the online writing lab, right? That everybody goes to, it's like a two sentence uh, definition. It, was, it wasn't very helpful. So I try to go back to Aristotle's idea of classical invention and just start asking questions like, what is X? Where did we first see X? Who else talks about X? You know, and just walking it through there. And I try to have some fun and be irreverent by putting a little bit of a soundtrack so when we talk about X, right? Let's talk about X, baby. It's okay. So we're trying to have a little bit of fun with some musical soundtrack there. But I, I built in like six. And then I thought, no, nah, I really want 10. And then I built like in something cheap, like a transition sentence and then an outro. So then I came up with two more. So we call it the dirty dozen. But my students don't know narration. They don't know the they, they don't know the essence of like building in that background. So I like what the other person was just sharing about that rhetorical context. I think that's huge, yeah. right? It's that simple triangle. If we don't know the rhetorical triangle, then we don't know that we need some background information or when it may be inappropriate to drop in background information or what's entailed there. But the really complex thing, the nuanced thing for my students is that if I give you 12, we don't need all 12 in the narratio element. And a narratio is not a paragraph. It could be a page. You know, for me, it's the, it's the page expander for a lot of my students are used to one, three, one, and I hate to limit this way, but now it becomes a one, four, one, you know, or the potential for growth when you build in uh, some background information, at least this element that my students didn't know um, is a game changer for us in a composition classroom. You're welcome to use that document if you find it useful. That's freely. Thanks, freely. Can I, can I, I we're, Given those two comments, let me um, ask: If we're just, if we're not just, but if if we're really looking at rhetoric, looking at looking at audience, having real audience, how is that different than than what you're proposing? Like, if we're really good writing teachers, do we need to focus on African American English? I'm not, I'm asking that sort of provocatively, but no. Um, Anybody can answer, not just him. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in, but if somebody else wants to. Well, I mean, Paul, what I would want to say back to you is mm -hmm. when you speak to somebody whose first language is French, mm -hmm. aren't, you, um, aren't you responsive to the context and the culture of that person? I know I have Danish friends who's, when they speak English, they're the way that their questions are worded stems from the way the question is worded in Danish. And it doesn't sound the same. It sounds confrontational. And yet I know that's not a con, they're not confronted. They're simply um, uh, novice English speakers. And they're using what they know of another language to ask the question. So why would it seem so provocative to say that about anybody who whose language isn't exactly like yours i mean maybe because yeah, it's been so you know it's been um relegated to, by some people to a um, lesser kind of communication, mm -hmm. maybe 
that's what's provocative. That seems to me to be the most provocative thing. That's awful. Mm -hmm. Because you know how that would feel when, when you, if, 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 if it was your culture and your language that's that was point. getting that yeah. kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Other thoughts? Oh, back to you, Anna. <laughs> anyway. okay. So the cultural bias implications um, in African American Englishes specifically. Um, and speaking of other languages like French or um, Greek, for example, where double negatives are used um, and it is not as scrutinized as in African American Englishes when um, a Black student uses double negatives to emphasize their point it is usually seen as, you know, something negative or correct. Um, it is language that is valuable slang. Those, um, and if we're talking about in the context of American classroom, um, yes, um, in this particular, you know, so of course we could talk. By them and language is treated as less than um, station here. But in this context, I, I think it's important to emphasize how to, you know, what language type situation. Can, 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 I, can I hop in? The thing I like to try to do is like create a, like, a, a, even if I'm, a, if I'm using AI or from just using whatever, like create a playground scenario in the classroom where I love the question where you had like how might it was a question around like mm. how would what would happen how would happen how would it change if you did this right and like how would it change if you used uh bilingual approaches how would it how would it sound if you so that how would it do is like it's almost like instrumentation it right it's almost like jazz and syncopation you can really play around and create some like and give kids that validation of both like you say meet them where they are like their language their authentic language and other forms of language so creating um i, I really like that question how would you draft change if you you know i always, always that's one of the big things i like to play with with kids um and i like to use like use the ai to even help with that like and mm -hmm. showing kids how they can use ai particularly if the ai is going to not be uh so constrictive as well which, Paul was talking a little bit about. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really struck me is I, I have never used Grammarly, but as a result of um, recently, people have been talking about it. So I put it on my computer to see what it was like. And I realized how it was training me to be less creative than my language is because it was pushing me back to standard speech. And just in a very small way, I felt like it was this impact that was really taking away from me rather than adding to my repertoire of language. Mm -hmm. mm. Great insights, folks. Keep going. Anybody else want to? Or Hannah, you have what, about 10 minutes left. So okay. What did, okay. What did you want to get to? Yeah. What did I want to get to? Okay. Um, I think I'm kind of on the fence, but since since we're we're really focused on um, on the importance of African American English in particular, um, I think cool. we'll look at some of this. So um, the work of Arnetha Ball, Stacey Perman Clark, Elaine Richardson, Bonnie Williams Farrier, each of those scholars has has written a lot about. Um, African American written rhetorical patterns in student writing. Um, Arnetha Ball had looked at um, 
starting with, I think, like late elementary school students. Um, and then um, the other scholars looked a lot at college student writing. And so um, their work gives lots of examples um, of patterns like topic association, um, repetition and recursion, focus on multiple points, shifts in topics. So a lot of um, implied connections implied thesis implied claims the reader needs to be more engaged to make inferences along the way and that contrasts pretty starkly with um like the very traditional what we re uh, reward in in standardized context right like the very explicit your thesis needs to be in a particular place and then it needs to be restated in a particular place and it needs to be explicitly connected to each point throughout and this can be at the beginning of the paragraph and this cannot and this can be at a right and so it's very different um and i think you know what i talk about in my book is that like um, and just like we're kind of talking about like audience and purpose, like all of these rhetorical patterns um, from the traditional, um, the traditional patterns and the African American English patterns can be useful for different audiences, for different purposes. Um, probably my guess is that a lot of us have used some of these patterns multiple times. Um, and kind of like cross them but it's a very stark in what's rewarded and that's what i found in my research that it's all the traditional pieces um i think I, it was um an article by bonnie williams where she she says a student is kind of like comparing the two and says like with with the um african-american rhetoric um with writing using that she's like you use your mind more when you read it right and so the traditional pattern can be really useful when we're just like yes here is this but it can also be very boring um and and not necessarily engaging um so um and then the big piece is we come back to the comments, right? So how are we going to respond to these different types of patterns in a way that's linguistically inclusive? And so this brings in like the questions. Um, it brings in um, specific descriptions that I mentioned earlier. Um, so asking students, what is the main point you expect your reader to infer? What are the pros and cons of leading your reader to that point versus spelling it out? Um, as opposed to, and this is just an example for my data from the traditional response side, your paper lacks focus that would be established with a clearly defined thesis. Okay, well, clear to who and in what context and focus isn't, like, what, what does that really mean here if the student thinks that they have spelled out um, what's, what, what their point is? um repetition i think that's a big one this example the traditional response i think is i adapted it from grammarly or it's it's from grammarly like three similar sentences in a row reword for variety i got hit with this a lot in grammarly when i ran my book through it a lot of repetition because i like to use some of the same words i mean like it was like can you find a synonym for assignment i'm like no it's an assignment it's nothing else it's an assignment i don't want people to get confused because i'm using an thesaurus for like another word for assignment um but um the linguistically inclusive response on the other side kind of like points out this is this is one way to respond so there's the questions and then there's like pointing out what's going on in the student's writing like this type of repetition is known as anaphora or whatever it might be and this is what it does for your writing gives it an engaging spoken quality or it gives it a spoken quality and the student can decide whether it's engaging for that particular um for their particular purpose right so giving the student information that then they can make decisions with and decide when do i want to use this strategy um and i think feedback you know is a really important place to do this i mean to me as someone who spent a lot of time teaching um college where you just have like less less time in the classroom with students i think feedback is a is like the the best way that we can differentiate instruction um, and res respond 
to students and like we're talking about meet them where they are. Um, it is nine o'clock. I'm just realizing at East Coast it's nine okay. o'clock. Yeah. So we're at the hour. So I can, I can stop. I don't know, Paul, where you want to. No, go. yeah, we'll just uh, give some yeah. people a chance to jump in if sure. you haven't yeah. had a chance yet. Um, I, I will jump in and say that um, how this relates to writing partners and AI. Um, mm -hmm. It may not be obvious to anybody here, but it is to me. Like we can take we feedback is is central to uh, the design of what we're doing um, there, and getting AI to not do traditional responding and getting it to do linguistic um, uh, linguistically um, uh, inclusive responses or African use re, refer to honoring African-American language is is something that is possible and we can do it through prompting and we can begin working on that um, and we can get students involved in that too. So anyway, that, that's some of the connection I, I wanted to mention here. Um, other thoughts as we're kind of closing out though uh, that anybody wants to offer to Hannah or to the group, please be bold here and jump in. I just, okay. I just, want to, I'll just say that um, I really loved what Sam was saying about kind of, take, you know, presenting the what if, you know, and kind of that like an inquiry or, a, a, you know, a improv or a compos, you know, a very compositional way of working. Um, you know, what if you added this or took out this or did this or, you know, so the sort of jazz metaphor, I'm just kind of hanging on to a little bit. I was also thinking about the role of mentor texts in all of this too, like being able to look at other texts and think about what patterns you see there. So those are just a couple of thoughts. I also like how you treated attribution because, um, it is not appropriate for every piece of writing to have MLA citations. And these are things that we can teach really young children. For example, we often say, if your mom or your dad, I used to work with little kids. If your mom or dad helped you, it's time to write a thank you in the front of your, before, you, before your work, thanking your parent for helping you. That's attribution, that's appropriate for young kids in that situation. And um, it, it's very, very important that librarians realize, I think, that attribution is more than simply following MLA. MLA is perfectly okay for certain situations and APA is perfectly okay, but it isn't the thing that you put on a sermon, right? <laughs> it's not, it doesn't work. It's not where it belongs. And, and I, I think that um, we could do a better job of that in K-12 in terms of how, how we ask kids to say, I got, I got information from, or I want to thank so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Yeah, I, yeah. You go ahead, jump in anybody. I was just going to respond and say, I think, you know, at the college level, a lot of a lot of the like the concept of attribution and 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 why it's important and, and just this whole idea, too, of who are you citing um, and who are you not citing and 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 um, when looking at it gets totally lost by the by the formatting. Right. And the just and the, the overwhelming fear of of plagiarism, accidental exactly. plagiarism. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Entirely different box than you should be in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with Guy. You must be familiar with Guy, but in his eight moves, the different moves that mm -hmm. he has. Yeah. For, yeah, I think that's a freeing way of, mm -hmm. using, of thinking about who you thank and how you respect mm -hmm. them. And that, that mm -hmm. goes well beyond, uh, you know, the skill of formatting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I missed what you said. I missed who you referred to. 
there's a guy who wrote an article, and I, I'll find the reference and stick it, uh, give it to, uh, to you. But his name is G A I P A, and he wrote a piece on how you, with wonderful stick figures that illustrate how you pick a pick a fight with your source or you compare two sources and you draw a new conclusion. I think that whole way of looking at um, the way that we deal with experts is a very helpful um, and ling linguistically appropriate way to deal with evidence and expertise. And you can really muddy the waters in a post remix culture in which we live right now. If you go look at a TED talk by Mark Ronson, who's one of the uh, you know top producers of this time, the beginning of that TED talk, he actually remixes probably no fewer than 25 or 30 TED talks to make a comment on music. And he's remixing, you know, audio samples and video samples, but nowhere in there do you see parenthetical citations or attributions. We just understand that what's what's happening is a remix is happening in front of you that you're listening to. So I think in honor of multimodal work, sometimes we change the way uh, we offer attribution or mm -hmm. uh, I like I like the thing that somebody's saying our, our gratitude, right? Our thanks to what we're consulting, but not necessarily citing. It's mm -hmm. a it's a tricky nuanced way of looking at how we produce things from multiple sources. I did uh, want to say uh, too on the topic of um, mentor checks. Um, Sierra Johnson, when the, the students who was on our our team for the online guides, um, created um, a page on um, that that just has like lots of things that sh that that we recommend that use different written pieces that use different African American English patterns. Um, I think it's called African American English across genres is the page on there and that's in the student cool mm -hmm. yeah thank you and um i will follow that up by saying that um another somebody else who you recommend um in different places around those kinds of thoughts is uh carmen canard and carmen mm -hmm. canard was a writing project uh consultant with uh, mm -hmm. us in the bronx for a while and she's coming on next week to continue this conversation so Hannah, thank you so much for continuing from last week, and uh, we're going to keep going. And you're welcome back at any time. No, thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me. Right. So Carmen Kennard will be with us, and um, you'll if you look her up in the uh, index, you'll find you'll find a few references that Hannah made to her as well. Um, thank you all. Anybody else want to jump in? Feel free, but um, we're going to kind of finish. Here, um, everybody. Any other thoughts? Thank you, Hannah. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, guys. And Good you have everybody. It's here on Wednesdays. Yeah. <laughs> and remember, everything on the table there is clickable, and it'll still be there. And if you want to look at some of the AI work that I've been messing around with, it, it's right below. Some of the some of that possibility to be thinking about. But we'll get back to all that. It's okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Thank you all. Good night, everyone.